everybody. I'm Dr. Poppy Moon, and today we are going to talk a little bit about career counseling. So career counseling, like um, community mental health counseling or school counseling that I talk on, on a, in, a, in another lecture, or in addictions counseling, rehabilitation counseling, all of these are different types of counseling specialties that you can go into. So career counseling is no different. And career counseling is just basically what it says it is. It's a process where individuals, they get guidance and they get support and they get the advice to be able to help them make informed decisions about their career paths and about their professional development. We have, <laughs> as everything, we have a timeline of how things kind of got started. So stage one, this is the history of career counseling and it starts with our friend, uh, Mr. Frank Parsons. And this guy, he was, he was very, cutting edge, I think, for what was going on. He was like, hey, young people need to be able to choose careers that are careers that are going to be a good match for them. And so he's called the father of vocational guidance. And he kind of came up with the concept that we are going to match an individual's traits to suitable occupations. And this laid the foundation for all of, of modern career counseling. So in 1908, he makes the very first vocational guidance center in the United States, and he calls it a vocational bureau. And the center aimed at providing young people with information to make guidance and career choices. He used something that's called a, a trait and factor approach. And he thinks that, um, that effective career decisions can be made if you match someone's individual traits, like their aptitudes and their interests and values, with the requirements of a specific occupation. And this approach very much emphasized the importance of matching up personal attributes with the demand of a job. Are you going to be successful in that job? Do you like it? Are you going to enjoy it? Will it be a good career choice for you? Um, so then we had stage two, and that is during the during the world wars and then after the post-war period. So that's like about 1929 um, to 1958. And what happened was during the war and, and afterwards, the military is like, oh, we need to have people who are ready to go to war. We need to have people who are trained in science, who are trained in mathematics, who are trained in um, strategies for being a, a good military leader. So career counseling services were expanded to kind of help people fit these roles, but also after the wars to be able to help veterans kind of reintegrate into a civilian life and to be able to use those skills that they had learned to be successful um, to be successful after the military. Now, the things that really started happening is during stage three. And this is around the time that the civil rights movement started and people wanted to find more meaning in their work. So this is from um, 1959 to about 1979. And we are seeing during this period a shift in career counseling. Uh, we're starting to see people move away from this predominantly white, which is this male-centric perspective, to one that acknowledges the needs of individuals from a whole bunch of diverse backgrounds. And a great thing during this time was it brought to light systemic racism and discrimination that had just permeated through all different areas of society, including education and especially including employment. Um, in the struggle for civil rights, it kind of highlights the needs for equal access to education, to training, to career opportunities for marginalized and minority populations. So during this time, the Equal Employment Opportunity and the Civil Rights Legislation Act, I think that was in 1964, this is a landmark piece of legislation um, that prohibited discrimination. You can't discriminate on race, you can't color, religion, sex, or, or national origin. Uh, origin. And it also had a, a really significant impact on employment practices. Uh, it sought to ensure equal access to job opportunities for fair treatment in the workplace. And these legal changes, it prompted organizations to, um, to reevaluate their hiring and promotion practice in order to be aligned with the new regulations that had come across. Okay, next, day, <laughs> next up is stage four. This is our information technology age. This is about 1980 to, um, to 2006. And what we're seeing during this time are significant advancements in information technology and the emergence of outplacement services. Um, as we're seeing widespread adoptions of computers, we're starting to see the beginning of the internet, revolutionizes the whole world. It revolutionizes how 
information is accessed, how it's processed, and how it's shared. And of course, this had a huge impact on career counseling because it allowed career counselors to be um, more efficient. They could use assessments, they can use data analysis, they can use communications um, between the career counselors and their clients using information, using computers and using um, all the new tech type of technology that was coming out at that time. Uh, then we have stage five, uh, 2007 to about 2013, and this is when we saw a huge housing uh, crisis, and then we also saw a recovery from that. So whenever you have a housing crisis, what happens is you have a significant disruption in the housing market. So um, there's a housing bubble burst. Uh, people are having problems affording housing. People are starting to... Um, there's foreclosure happening on people's houses. And we're seeing a, an economic downturn. And during this time, this can contribute to like job loss and financial stability, which of course all affects an individual's housing situation. So during times like these, people will probably go and seek career counseling to navigate all these challenges. So they can look at new opportunities, new types of training so that they can be successful in the new market that, that, is, that is coming about. So career counseling, it had some different vocational roots. I think that, that the first one that was huge, a huge impact was the Great Depression. The impact on employment from 1929 to the 30s, it led to widespread unemployment and economic turmoil. So you have these individuals and they're facing challenges. They are having problem finding employment. They're having problem maintaining employment extremely, extremely stressful. So there's a focus on vocational guidance at that time. We see the economic crisis and they were like, hey, we need to come up with comprehensive vocational guidance services so we can help these people as they navigate the new job market to make sure that they have opportunities that are matching their skills and matching their abilities. Um, the next thing that came up was Roosevelt's New Deal, had big, big employment initiatives. So as part of the New Deal, uh, President Roosevelt he introduced very employ various employment initiatives to combat the effects of the Great Depression. And these initiatives were creating jobs, supporting public works and projects, and simulating economic recovery. Then we have the National Employment Counseling Association, which um, becomes a thing. It's established in 1913, and it's one of the very earliest professions that we have that were dedicated simply to promoting the field of employment and counseling and um, vocational guidance. And then next up is, of course, the Social Security Act. And this was in 1935, and it was part of the New Deal. And it was great because it established a system of social insurance. You have employment benefits, and you start to have retirement pensions. So let's take a look at career counseling today. The 2018 Occupational Outlook Handbook, it predicted that job opportunities for counselors are really going to grow between 2014 and um, 2024. We're starting to really see that right now. So the labor market is going to become even more diverse, and we're seeing that population growth rate among Hispanics. It's starting to outpace both um, African American and whites. And during that time, uh, around 2018, the World Economic Forum Future of Jobs report said that the use of internet and artificial intelligence and cloud technology is going to continue to replace workers in some jobs, but it's also going to create other jobs, and those jobs are going to be for people who are highly trained and highly skilled, so people that come to a career counselor to be able to um, to get some assistance in looking forward into, into what they're going to be able to do. Uh, career counselors are right on the cutting edge of that. And they're like, hey, these are new jobs. These are ways that you can train and that you can be successful and, and skilled and ready to, to go into that. Okay, as everything, <laughs> as everything that you study in graduate school, there are always different theoretical approaches to, to, the, to career counseling. So these are some of the ones that are uh, the biggies. Trait and factor. Like I was saying at, at the beginning, our friend Frank Parsons, he was trying to figure out that there was a person and job fit, that those things kind of matched together. And out of trait and factor came Holland's vocational choice theory, and that's also known as RIASEC. So in this theory, it is a widely recognized framework that category, categorizes careers and individuals based on these six different personality types. Uh, realistic, which is R, Investigative, which is I, Artistic, A, Social, S, Enterprising, E, and Conventional, which is C. And the theory proposes that individuals are more likely to be satisfied and successful in careers that align with their dominant personality types. So if you have people with certain um, 
you have people with certain personality traits and they gravitate toward specific work environments and they are, are doing tasks that resonate, resonate with their interests and their preferences. So for example, someone that is super artistic, they might thrive in a creative profession, uh, while those that have social tendencies might excel in roles involving interpersonal interactions. So that might be someone who would like to be a career counselor. So kind of a kind of to give you an example, let's say that we have um, just a kid named Jamie, and he's trying to decide what career path. So he takes some career assessments, he has some discussions with a career counselor, and he realizes that he has strong artistic and social tendencies. So he has the A and he has the S of the personality type. And he says, you know, I might want to work in a really creative field where I'm able to work with other people. So the career counselor is like, okay, here are some options for you. You could be a graphic designer. You could go into art therapy, which is what uh, my, my focus is. Um, you could become an event coordinator. And all of those different things would kind of match his interests and his personality traits. So the career counselor might say, hey, you should also attend some networking events. You should go to some workshops where there are also people that are in the field that are already professionals and kind of meet those people, kind of pick their brain and find out what they think is interesting and, and how their career, um, their, her, their career path is something that you could look at and kind of use that as a model. So being able to use Holland's vocational support theory, uh, aligning that with Jamie's personality and his aspirations are going to help him be successful in the type of career that he wants to choose. Okay, next word we have is social learning. An example of that is Crumbolt's learning theory of career counseling. So his theory uh, posits that individuals' career decisions are shaped by a combination of their genetic traits, their environmental factors, learning experiences, and their interaction uh, with the world. The theory highlights the role of planned and unplanned events in shaping one's career path. So what this thing is doing is it's emphasizing that learning is a lifelong process and that individuals constantly adjust their career choices based on new experience and new insights. And if you are a career counselor, and you were using this theory, uh, you're gonna help clients explore their past experiences. You're gonna say, hey, remain open to new opportunities and let's make some informed decisions that are aligning with your understanding of yourself and your goals. So let's think of a guy, let's call him Alex. And he thinks, hey, I am very good at math and I'm very good at science. So I think that I'm going to focus on those kind of skills. But he goes and he does an internship at an engineering firm. And he's like, mm, this corporate work environment, it doesn't resonate with me, uh, resonate with me. It is too structured. I feel like I don't have any creative freedom. So Alex thinks about this and he thinks, hmm, no, when I was a kid, I had a passion for art and design. And so he goes and he volunteers at a local community center. And he's like, oh, I have these talents for organizing events and for connecting with people. So he can use that math and science brain that's able to kind of logically put different things in order. And he can use that to work on creating events, putting together events at the community center. And so doing that, he feels more filled in himself and he feels better about his career. And he's kind of got that balance between his personal interests and his interpersonal skills. So that is uh, that one also social learning is great. Another theory that we have is developmental theory. And out of that, we have our good friend, Donald Super, and he has the lifespan, life space, and career maturity span. That's a, <laughs> that's a lot to say. But basically, all it does is it has career development. It says, hey, career development is a lifelong process. And this is something that's influenced by an individual's evolving roles and their personal growth experiences. So Super thinks we go through a whole bunch of stages. We go through stages of growth, we go through exploration, we do establishment, and we do maintenance throughout our lives. And um, the whole concept of career maturity is that an individual can effectively manage their career choices and their transitions. So for instance, let's say that we have a woman named Sarah. She's in her 30s and she's been working for a whole bunch of years as a, a marketing manager. And she's thinking, hmm, I want to have a career choice that I can have a better work-life balance because she's just become a mom. She wants to be there for her kid, but she also doesn't want to give up her career because that's fulfilling for her. So if she's going to draw from uh, Donald Super's theory, 
then her transition reflects the lifespan and the space concept that she has. So her shift is uh, from the exploration and establishment stages in her marketing career to exploring a new role that aligns better with her evolving life role as a parent. And so she may have some really dynamic career changes. So she may find, hey, working from home or being a hybrid worker is better for her because that way she can be there for her child. So she's also, um, she's feeling good because she's still being able to use that career that she established, but she's working towards changing it. Um, so it can be some something that makes her feel good that she's focusing on her personal and professional aspirations. And she's finding that balance in her career trajectory. I, that's the one I think I, I go with most though. If I had to pick one, I would definitely say the developmental that we change over time. And we become, and see you guys, just like, just like now you're just starting out. You are beginning uh, here as graduate students. You're gonna go through that. You'll start your career as counselor. And as you go through, you may move to become a professor. And then you may use that as your maintenance space where you teach people um, how to be excellent and amazing counselors. Okay, so we have another approach, the postmodern approach. And one of those that is that comes to my mind is Sonny Hansen's and it's his integrative life planning. Doesn't that sound cool? It's like um, Sonny Hansen's integrative life planning program. So this approach is a really holistic approach and it's going to integrate various aspects of an individual's life. They're going to look at personal, career, spiritual, and they're going to take all of that and make it into a cohesive plan. So what I like about this is it kind of recognizes that career decisions are interconnected with broader life goals and values. So by considering not only professional aspirations, but also personal interests and relationships and spiritual well-being, you can have an individual that has a more meaningful and fulfilling life path. So let's take a look at Thomas. He is a mid-career professional. He's been successful in his corporate job, but he's like, mm, I'm starting to feel unfulfilled and I'm starting to feel disconnected from my personal passions. So by using Sunny Hansen approach, um, Tom begins to reflect on his career choices uh, in the context of broader life goals and values. And Thomas is realizing, hey, my true passion uh, really lies in environmental sustainability. And I also really like community involvement. So he thinks, ah, this is a realization. How can I use those things to make my life, uh, you know, more well-rounded, more of who I want to be as a person? So the career counselor working with Tom, they could start exploring opportunities in nonprofit organizations that specifically focus on sustainable development to find a career that he's really going to enjoy. And that's also going to be a part of who he is uh, holistically as a person. Okay. Assessment and technology in career counseling. Now that we are in the, the technology age and we have all of these wonderful um, new ways of figuring out who we are, we can use different types of tests to be able to find out what type of careers may be helpful for us. Uh, one of those is an aptitude test. And tests like that help people um, demonstrate uh, an inherited or learned ability. So these tests can say, are you capable of providing uh, performing requirements for certain jobs? And one of these tests that has been popular and is, you know, has always been out there is the ASVAB, which is the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. Another thing that we have to career counselors can use is interest tests. And interests are, you know, just a set of beliefs or attitudes about a given activity. And the more interested you are in something, the more likely that you are going to be motivated to do it, even if pursuing it comes at a high price. Interest tests that you probably have heard on, career interest inventory, um, Cooter Occupational Interest Survey, and then the one I think is, is one that everyone uses is the Occupational Information Network, and that's known as ONET. Uh, these are able to tell you, hey, what are you most interested in? What works? Then of course we have personality tests and personality encompasses who we are, how we see the world and the functions. And our personality really doesn't change over time. Unlike preferences and values, which do change, our, um, our personality pretty much stays the same. So uh, in career assessment, personality inventories are frequently used in conjunction with the interest surveys. One that you have probably always heard about is Myers-Briggs type indicator test. And this is one that has all of these different personalities and 
you take the test and they put it all together and it it spits out <laughs> it spits out a little number for you, a little letters that kind of come together and it explains who you are as a person and what type of careers might be helpful. If you are ever interested in doing a free personality test, you can go to 16 personalities online and it's a lot of fun. It's it's pretty much aligned with the Myers Briggs and it can give you an example of, um, of what your personality might be like. Other things that career counselors can focus on is values, and values are our principles. They are the standard by how we judge what's important in our lives, and they do shift around uh, based on a whole variety of factors. Examples of values, the value scale, and Rokich, I hope that I say that right, it's R-O-K-E-A-C-H, Rokich Value Survey. Those are some examples of value surveys. Okay. Career information delivery systems. Today, almost all career information is available on the internet. And there's hundreds and hundreds of sites that you can go to and they will address anything from self-assessment and jobs posting to resume development, interview pointers, and you know everything that you could want. Um, people may say, well, then why would you wanna be a career counselor if those things are readily available to people? Most people need assistance with different things. Uh, a lot of people, they are not, they don't understand what's available to them or how to use what's available in order to help them be more successful in their career. So career counselors are always gonna be needed to be able to put all of this stuff that I talked about today together so that they can present that to a person to help them be successful. Um, if you are ever interested in seeing how a lot of that works, you could get in contact with a high school guidance counselor and they would be able to talk to you about all of the different things that they do to help teenagers move on from being a high school, moving on to a vocation, moving on to college, or moving on into the world of work. And they use a lot of those things to be able to help students figure out what's right for them. Of course, as all of the lectures that I've done for this class, we talk about ethics and advocacy. All groups, career counselors included, have their own form of ethical standards that they use. And the American Counseling Association, they have it very much aligned with uh, ACA. And if you ever are interested in those, which I think that you should be and that you would want to look at these during different classes, the Code of Ethics and how the Code of Ethics applies to working with people. So you can always go to their website and just type in Code of Ethics and it'll bring it up there, all of it for you to take a look at. Uh, I think one of the things that career counseling that is starting to move towards that is something that's going to be much bigger in the future is special interests and special interests for career counselors that might fall into spirituality, um, gender, sexual orientation and family issues, people with disabilities and jobs that they can be successful in, uh, people who have mental health and substance abuse issues who need assistance. And of course, one of the newest ones that is, is coming out is distance counseling, where counselors are able to provide information to clients over um, things like telehealth. So there you go, my lecture on career counseling. Hope that that helps you get a little bit more uh, insight on how everything works. If you have any questions for me, you can always email me at moon at ulm.edu and we can talk on the phone or by email or we can always do a Zoom meeting. So I hope that helps you and I enjoyed doing this for you today. Okay.